So welcome back once again, His Eminence Cardinal Tuxen is the Prefect of the Dicastery for the Promotion of Integral Human Development in the Vatican. We are thankful that Cardinal Tuxen has given Caritas Singapore his personal attention and priority. Thank you, Cardinal. We are eager to hear his theological reflection on our theme, Integral Human Development, Hold of Me, All of Us, One Christ. Please welcome His Eminence, Cardinal Tuxen. Okay, so, uh, so thank you for your kind introduction, and thank you Caritas uh, Singapore for your invitation. Uh, that makes, that's enabled me to be part of uh, your weekend celebration. And that's also enabled me to visit Singapore for the first time. So, so thank you for... Thank you for making me do this pilgrimage. <laughs> Sometimes a lot of people think about doing pilgrimages to Rome and Fatima and Jerusalem and all of that. But this time it's pilgrimage to the south and to Singapore. So thanks for everything now. Uh, by way of doing, uh, dealing with this uh, integral human uh, development, uh, which, incidentally, is the name of our, of our dicastery, of our office. I, I like to see how best to handle this for you. The, the, the Archbishop already you know, entered that a little bit with you this morning. And I don't want to do a straight theological text reading or anything like that. So what I decided to do was to show you where it's all coming from. And then the meaning and the significance of the evolution of this expression in the life of the church. And then how Pope Francis made this the name of an office in the Vatican what the responsibility of that office now is, and how the office understands its own self as invited to carry out this task of uh, realizing the church's mission of promoting integral human development, and then try to link it, link it at the end with who and what you are, carry task. So this organ in the church, that makes the charity of Christ its mission. So this briefly is what I'd like to do with you this morning. So it's going to be, I'm going to try to do some kind of interactive action, interactive uh, presentation uh, in the hope that we can be on the same uh, page as it were. By way of uh, beginning, Integral human development clearly has as a central expression the theme of development. And that's why I like to begin by inviting you to consider and to recognize the fact that the church is not the only institution in the world that talks about development you know about the SDGs. The SDGs are about sustainable development goals. Before the SDGs, we had the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. And the United Nations has an ongoing office which is called the UNDP, United Nations Development. So, you know, the world, there are a lot of world institutions which are interested in development. Okay, so when we, as a church, also talk about integral human development, 
First and foremost, we need to recognize that we're not the only one that is talking development or using this expression. When this is the case, then we need to discover what is our specific understanding of development? What makes our use of development unique? And in that sense, what is our unique contribution to the idea of development? And those are the type of things that we like to try to talk about. For us as a church, the issue of development is undergirded by a very genuine sense of an anthropology, an authentic Christian anthropology, which is the understanding of the human person. Who or what is the human person? And when we do not understand who or what the human person is, talking about its development becomes problematic. When you're not sure what the sub-object is, how do you work about its development? So the sense of Christian anthropology is very basic for us in our talk about integral human development. And when that is the case, we'll see. We'll see where we go. Okay, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, if you, I hope nobody will drown, but, but if, you, if you feel you're drowning, put up your head. So, you know, I will do a lot of repetition, okay, so that, so that you know, uh, we try to somehow understand what we're doing. So, Integral Human Development is the name of our office, an office which is a merger of four hitherto independent existing offices. So in August 2016, Pope Francis decided to merge four offices in the Vatican, Justice and Peace, Cor Unum, Migrants, and Healthcare, and the name became an office for promoting integral human development. So our task is to promote integral human development. And what does that mean for us? So what it means for us is just what I want to share with you through these power slides a little bit, and in the hope that it can whatever. So what I'm moving away from is providing a theological presentation of integral human development can have, could have been a lecture. I didn't choose that option. I chose this interactive option about integral human development in the hope that at the end we'll still you know, land on the same target. So what you're looking at there is the name of this dicastery, and this is the beginning of it. Pope Francis, this is, a, this is a sense of what it all begins. The preoccupation with the social development of humankind, the Archbishop also talked about this a little bit early this morning, is a theme which the church took up and made her principal uh, concern from her birth. From the birth of the church, the concern for the development of the humankind has been at, of interest to the church. Just think about the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 and chapter 4, and what they say about the early Christian community. They lived together, shared resources together, so that there will be no poor one among them. This was the vision of the church right from the beginning, sharing resources so that there will be no poor one among them, taking care of the needs of all members of the emergent nascent Christian community so there will be no poor one among them. So this is the social development of the humankind being a theme of the church right from its birth. And then a reflection of, this, of the meaning of authentic human development it's also in the past of the history gone through very many expressions, and the popes have taken this up and worked on it in different stations, becoming now the sole principles in the social teaching of the church. So this is this concern that undergirds the name of this dicastery. So what is it? What is integral human development? So Poplorum Progressio, the Archbishop introduced it this morning. You know that. 
Pope Paul VI was the Pope who concluded the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council was opened by Pope John XXIII, and it was concluded by, John, uh, by Paul VI. Now, this was 65. In 1965, when Pope Paul concluded the Vatican Council, he began traveling around with the message of the Council, visited India, visited Africa for the first time, and then began to understand and present himself as the advocate of the poor. So wherever Pope, John, uh, Pope uh, Paul VI went, he referred to himself as the advocate of the poor. So when he stood before the United Nations in New York to speak, he referred to himself as the advocate of the poor. So he was talking about, again, the poor and how the world can address the issue of the poor. And what, is that, what, the, what, the, what does that mean? In the, at the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, about the council itself you know, Right? You know about the Second Vatican Council? OK. <laughs> oh, so I can ask you questions, right? <laughs> now, if, if, if nothing at all, the one thing you can take away from the Second Vatican Council was that it signaled for the church the beginning of a lot of new relations. These new relations in the Catholic Church began, 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 be, gave rise to several of the councils. You remember at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII said he wanted the, opens of the, the windows of the church to be thrown open so the world can see into the church and so the church can see the world outside. So for the first time, the church wanted to address the reality of the conditions of people outside the church. And that is why in Gaudium et Spes, the document about development in, that came out of the council, the fathers of the council said that there is no better way of showing affection for humanity than to enter into dialogue with it. So the Second Vatican Council called for a new way of the church dialoguing with humanity about all its conditions poor, rich, whatever, whatever the conditions are. And that underlies John, you know, Paul VI's uh, uh, solution. In a very concrete way, from my part of the world, it was in the 60s that several African countries became independent. So several countries got their independence in the 60s. And therefore, several countries emerging into independence, the problem about their development also became an issue for the church. So Populorum Progressio does not only address the issue of the church and independence, but the church seeing so very many nations now being born, how is their independence and their growth to be accompanied and sustained? So that was Paul VI and his Populorum Progressio. But in that, he said, that the concept of integral human development cannot be limited to economic growth. If it's only economic growth, then we're not dealing with the holistic sense and the development of the human person. So authentic development must be well-rounded. It must foster the development of each person and the whole, human, whole, whole person. That is almost the theme of your Congress uh, this weekend. So for, a develop, for development to be authentic, it must be about each one completely and then about all of us, all of humanity. And John Paul II would add and say, including those who are yet to be born, including those still who have to be born. And then Father Libre who was a consultant at the Second Vatican Council, asked what you read there. We cannot allow economics to be, to be separated from human and the, and, and the development of civilization where it fits. Namely, economic must fit into development patterns of humanity. What counts for us is man, the human person, man, woman, 
each man and each group of men, including the whole of humanity. This is what is important. And co con contrasting this with economics, you can almost cast your mind back to what Pope Francis these days says. Huh? Money must serve the man, and not man serve money. Okay, already then, the words of Pope Paul already make us think about that. But it was Pope Francis who will make it, you know, who will make the point straight and point blank. Okay, human beings must not serve money. Money must rather serve human beings. So the concerns of human person is number one. Therefore, Pope, uh, John, Pope uh, Benedict XVI took Popularum Progressio and identified the main concerns. That's what you see there. Therefore, development, according to Pope Paul VI, is it is that which rescues people, first and foremost, from hunger, from deprivation, from endemic disease, and illiteracy. Two, from the economic point of view, development means active participation on equal terms in the international economic processes. So the economic system will be inclusive, not some to the exclusion of others. Then, thirdly, from a social point of view, integral human development is the evolution into, education, into educated societies marked by solidarity. And then, from a political point of view, development means consolidation of democratic regimes capable of ensuring development and peace. So, as you see, development is not simply economically formulated. There's something that you can talk about development economically, socially, politically, and uh, its general sense of uh, bringing the, uh, drawing people out of poverty. So, with this uh, sense of Pope uh, John Paul II, we go on. There is what Pope Paul VI had said about development. The subsequent popes take up the thing and then develop it. When we go to, when we come to Pope John Paul II, he takes up the theme of integral human development and expands it still further. And for Pope John Paul II, though variously expressed, the social concern of the church is directed towards an authentic development of man and society. The authentic development of man and society. And the question is, what is authentic development? of man and society. This is where the sense of the anthropology comes in. What is the human person? And if there's an authentic development, there must be a development that makes the whole of the human person flourish. And in that sense, I may add already here, the sense of development is not doing something to something or somebody to make it become something. That's not what development is. Because as we shall see later, and the Archbishop referred to this, Pope John Paul II started, but Pope Benedict makes it strong enough in characters in Veritate that development is the vocation of every human being. If it's a vocation, then that's what we were created to be. And therefore, development is the flourishing of every human being, creating the image and likeness of God with a sense of dignity, Anything that makes your dignity flourish, that is your development. It's not something that an outsider does to you to make you become something, no. You have it already, you created that way in the image and likeness of God with this expression and sense of dignity. Making this flourish, facilitating its blossoming, this is the process of development. And it's said to be therefore authentic meaning corresponds to the true nature of the human being, the true nature of the human spirit. If you want, as was said, you know, the two natures of Jesus put together, Pantocrator, it means that we both flesh and spirit. When development is concerned only about flesh, material, technology, and economics, to their exclusion of the transcendental spiritual part, this is not genuine development. This is not authentic development. It is not holistic, and it is not wholesome development for the human person. 
Pope John Paul II goes on, true development cannot consist in the simple accumulation of wealth. This is the sense that we get. And for a long time, when the United Nations was talking about the development of people, it always talked about GDP. Huh? You remember that expression? Every talk about development is GDP. What is the GDP? $2 a day, or $1.5 a day, or $3 a day. This is the indicator of development. But even before the church's voice was heard, we still had economists like Amartya Sen and Habab Urhak, Pakistan, who started already drawing attention to the fact that we cannot limit development to this GDP. So with Amartya Sen and Habavuka, development then began to be, become, what is the access to education? What is the access to communication? What is the access to work and labor? All of these different access, these constitute the divorce. So this was, there, there was the invitation already by these economists to move away from GDP to consider the other services that a human person can have. So development is not just GDP, how much money you make. That is not the true sense of development. But the other facilities, all the services and the needs of the human person. So that's why John Paul II says this, it cannot consist in the simple accumulation of wealth and the greater availability of goods and services. Development is not because you can go into Walmart or Montgomery, or CS. Yeah. What are the big supermarkets here? <laughs> yeah. So whatever it is, so, so you can always access the goods are there and uh, so whatever. This, you know, this is not that thing. This is not that thing. Accumulation of wealth and then the greater availability of goods and services. If this is gained at the expense of the development of masses, and without due consideration for the social, cultural, and spiritual dimensions of the human being. And so he goes on to say the third one. Therefore, it should be obvious that development either becomes shared in common by every part of the world, or it undergoes a process of regression. When development is not shared and limited to a few, we cannot talk about development. So development must be something that becomes the common attribute, if you want, of all of humanity. And this, again, for us, is based on our sense of the human person, our anthropology. Because our anthropology says that human beings were created in the image and likeness of God. And all of them are from the same womb, therefore equal in dignity. And the resources of the earth were put at the disposal of humanity. So the resources of the earth were not put at the disposal of some to the exclusion of others. So that's why in our church social teaching, we talk about the universal destination of the goods of the earth. The goods of the earth were destined for all, all of humanity. It's not a section of humanity having access to the goods of the earth and a section of society not having access to the goods of the earth. Okay, so that's why uh, it has to be for all. This tells us that a great deal about the nature of authentic human development uh, is this, that either all of the nations of the world participate or it will not be true development. Solitude race socialis uh, of John Paul II. Either all have access to this or it is not really genuine development. And so John Paul II concludes, economic development alone, money alone, and slaves makes us slaves of money. And as I mentioned already, Pope Francis D. says, says that money must serve the human being, but human being must not serve money. Okay, but in our materialistic whatever world, the tendency is to just make money. When there's time, whatever, after that, we look at the economic crisis, the financial crisis, and the implications for this. 
So he then sums up, authentic development includes the cultural, transcendent, and religious dimensions of the human person and his society too. It recognizes the ex existence of such dimensions and endeavors to direct its goals and priorities towards the same. Therefore, the development of the whole person and all peoples are also a matter of religion. All right, because of what he has said earlier on, authentic development includes cultural, transcendent, and religious dimensions. And so he goes on to say, therefore, the thing about development of the whole person is also a matter of religion. This will be developed further by Pope Benedict, who will say that the true development is caritas in veritate. Okay, based on what, you know, uh, what Christ is. For it depends above all on God. Have you heard this before? That development depends on God. So development is not really what we do, but development in a way is all, let's say, something that depends on God. Why does John Paul teach, teach that? Because the point, John Paul is stepping one head ahead of all of us. If the human being, right after creation, fell, okay, sin, then it just means that the activities of the human person is constrained by sin. And it is only the grace of God that releases the whole human person to be able to do what he freely wants to do. So in the life of the human person, we're looking at what humanity does and is influenced by sin. And then how humanity redeemed by Jesus and made, okay, with a pathway to grace, is enabled to overcome all the constraints of human nature to make him live truly and fully as a human person. And this then becomes a work of God to the extent that it is a work of grace. So after John Paul II, we, we, you know, who has you know, added to this concept, we can look at what Pope Benedict also adds to this. And Pope Benedict the 16 developed an encyclical called Caritas in Veritate, Charity in Truth. You familiar with that encyclical? Hmm? There, was, there was more, Vatican II was more years than Caritas in Veritate. Huh? Okay. Okay, if you, you know, the, the first beginning line of Caritas in Veritate is this. Charity in Truth, to which Jesus Christ bore witness by his earthly life and especially by his death and resurrection, is the principal driving force behind authentic development. Charity in truth, which Jesus manifested, came to witness with his life and his death, this is the principal driving force behind authentic human development. Cut it short, what you just say, what Pope Benedict is saying that charity is the binding right driving force of authentic human development. Without charity, there can be no true development. And this is the thing that we need to unpack if we time we get into this. So development, authentic human development without charity is going to be impossible. In 2014, I took a message of Pope Francis to Davos, the World Economic Forum in Davos. And there, the Pope Davos addressing business people. The Pope says, all of you business people, you do a very noble thing. Business is a noble vocation, okay? It's a very noble thing. But provided you, who have given proof of your expertise and talents and all of that, you put all of this also at the disposal of the development of the poor. When these, these, these ways that, you know, in which you have excelled, you need to bring all of this also to the service of the poor. Now, that's already talking the language of charity. You as business people have excelled, but in charity, bring this also to the level of the poor, to raise up also the poor. Otherwise, development is not inclusive. So what we're saying is that inclusive development takes place only through charity. 
Sometimes you say through solidarity. But that's how that thing happens. So from what Pope Benedict says, we can draw two points. The whole church in all her being and calling, when she proclaims, when she celebrates, when she performs works of charity, is engaged in promoting integral human development. In the slides that we saw this morning, you showed a lot of the works of charity that you perform. Pope Benedict is saying that already in performing works of charity, you are engaging promoting human development. So that's already something that in your own ministry and what you do as characters, you're already involved in. Then he goes on to say authentic de human development concerns the whole of the person in every single dimension, not only economic, not only financial, but economic, financial, cultural, spiritual, social, all of these dimensions must be involved in development. So you know what? Two weeks, two weeks, a week ago, today is Saturday, right? So uh, on the, yeah, on the, on the 8th and the 9th, we organized a session in Rome on impact investing, social impact investing. You know about that industry. Singapore is into a lot of finance, so you must know about social impact investing. And the investors who came together, came together to see how with social impact investing, they can promote integral human development. Okay? So it just meant with their investment as investors, how can they use their resources so financially, how can they use their resources to promote integral human development? Then at the end, in concluding, I said, it's great that you've come to discuss how you can, with your investment, promote integral human development. But it's also necessary to see you as investors, how integrally developed you yourselves are. And then the whole thing was quiet. <laughs> but that's what it is. They've come as an investor, but probably all just holding money. How are they socially, culturally, spiritually? That's not talked about. What they've come with was portfolios of monies, okay? Pension fund and this fund and this fund. So they've come with their finances to promote integral human development. But how integrally humanly developed are they themselves? And so that just means that what they have doesn't go beyond the possession of wealth and of their soul, culturally, spiritually, and all, all those other areas of their lives. How well are they also all developed? Then it was only at the end that a couple of them took it and said, you know, we never thought about that. But that's what it is. That's what it is. Development is not just economic and monies. Development has to be cultural, transcendent, religious, social, and all of those things. You will see a slide very soon coming up about how social, socially undeveloped things can be. So the development of individuals and people require new eyes and a new heart, capable of rising above materialistic vision of human events. It is not all dollars and cents, and all technology and all, that's not just what is, you know, they part of development, but that's not the whole story. And what we're talking about is making the story complete, not just partial, but make it complete. It should be capable of glimpsing in development the beyond that technology cannot give. By following this part, it is possible to pursue the integral human development that takes its direction from the driving force of charity in truth. So let us go beyond material, technology, finances, and look at the other self of uh, the development. So this is an attempt to put together the com conclusions of Bennett, which I shall skip. Uh, and uh, at the middle of it, you see what the Archbishop talked about. Pope Francis says, in reality, institutions by themselves are not enough because integral human development is primarily a vocation 
It's not something about finances and all of that, and therefore it involves a free assumption of responsibility. And it requires a transcendent vision of the person. That's our into our anthropology again. It requires a transcendent vision of the person. So who is the human being for you? We say the human being is created an image and the likeness of God. Therefore, it's not just material, or you take the second account of creation. When God was creating the human person, he took a dust, earth, and formed the human person, and then breathed into the nostrils, and then he became a live, living soul, right? So human beings are living souls to the extent that the earth is breathed into by the Spirit of God. So our dimensions are dual. We eat and material, but we also spiritual. Therefore, when development concerns only the material and neglects the spiritual, development is not complete and it's not total for us. That's the point that we, we, we're making. So it goes on, therefore, only through an encounter with God are we able to see in the other something more than just another creature, to recognize the divine character in each one. That's why Mother Teresa of Calcutta walked down the streets of India and picked up the poor people from the gutter because she saw something in them. It's also like the gospel in the, about the Good Samaritan. A priest comes and walks by, didn't see something. Somebody comes and he sees something else in the, in the poor one and the person in need. So that's what Benedict is saying. We need to, we need to develop new eyes and a new heart to be able to see in the other human person something else so that we can address all of that. So putting it all together, Pope Francis then steps on the scene and then also formulates the very concept of person born and matured in Christianity helps in the pursuit of a fully human development because person means relation, not individualism. It affirms inclusion, not exclusion. Unique and inviolable dignity rather than exploitation, freedom, and corruption. This, again, is a crucial point of our Christian anthropology. To say that human beings are persons means that you're talking about relations. Person is the sense of the human person that reaches out to be in relation with others. So we created to coexist and in our coexistence, pursue the common good of all of us. So relationality or in relational anthropology, that is the nature of the human person. I don't, I, I, I don't want to talk too much because one thing leads to the other. Because it is understanding of ourselves as living in relations that leads to the other sounds about justice. But we cannot go into that now, we, otherwise we'll probably never finish this term. So the church never gets tired of offering this wisdom and her work. And what is this wisdom? That the person is a relational being. In the past, they used to say that no man is an island, right? That used to be the expression, no man is an island. Because we are relational beings created to coexist and in our coexistence, pursue our common good. That is our destiny. That's where we were created to be. And it is as such that a development also includes social uh, component of development. So, putting it all together from Pope Paul to Pope Francis, what can we say? So between the Pope who opened the Vatican Council, that is John the 23rd, and the Pope who closed it, that is Paul VI, an idea about the development or the flourishing of the human person is born, which other subsequent Popes took up and developed into what now has become the name of our dicastery, a dicastery for promoting integral human development. And what is it? A holistic approach to development. Holistic, huh? all parts taken together, and which covers all aspects of life, meaning social, economic, political, spiritual, cultural, personal. All of this must come together to be able to talk about integral human development. 
when we tempted to only limit it to one aspect, which is the easiest, make more money, okay? On the Calvins, you know, whatever. You know, we're not the only ones, you, the Catholic Church is not the only one who try, interprets the Bible, right? There are other Protestant churches. Calvinism has the idea of prosperity being a sign of blessing. So everybody looks for that to be able to say, I'm blessed by God. That's not a sense. Why then did Jesus say the Son of Man has even no place to lay his head? So it is not all material prosperity. That's, that's just not what makes the human person what it is. So in the social teaching of the church, the classic understanding of integral and authentic development is rooted in relational anthropology and in the interconnectedness and interrelatedness of all things. Pope Francis says all things are connected. The human person is created to coexist with others to pursue their common good. So we're talking about inclusive well-being, inclusive development. That's what our vocation is. So summing it all up, development therefore is holistic, all together. Development is for all people, not just a few. Development is about the whole human person, <clears throat> not just material or political part, but everything about the person. Development offers a feasible model of social integration. Development comprises the care for the environment, natural resources. Development then, especially from Pope Paul VI, is the path for peace. And development is also the path to the good and the flourishing, which is the vocation of the human being, integral human development. Therefore, this cannot be development. The coexistence of wealth and poverty is not development. This is Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. But probably you can also, I can also see this in Nairobi, in Kenya, where on one side of the city there's wealth, another side of the city abject poverty. You call it slums. I've been here for only three hours, so I, don't, I can't talk about Singapore. Uh, so, so I'm not talking about that. <clears throat> I talk about what I know. Okay, just last Monday, I, you know, I was in Rio de Janeiro. I saw this. Okay, coexistence of wealth and poverty. This means that development is not inclusive. Development here is exclusive. Some and not the rest. The other one you see there is from Bangladesh. Okay, where Pope Francis says that the earth is becoming like a pile of filth. Okay, this again, when that is the case, this is also not development. So true development should not make the earth look like a pair, a pile of filth, junkyard or whatever. True development is also not that. But because we have experiences like this, Pope Francis says, I have a dream. And what is the dream? I dream of a missionary option, an impulse capable of transforming everything, of promoting the development of the entire person, the development of all people, while caring also for creation of the earth. So the urgent challenge includes consent to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. For we know that things can change. This is the message of Laudato Si, the last encyclical of Pope Francis. I know that things can change. And this is also the mission and the language and the gospel of Christians. Things can change with the grace and the help of God. That's why it's possible to emerge out of any form of vitiated you know, development limited to material, whatever type, and begin to make it richer, more inclusive form of development because things can change. So the agent challenge includes a consent to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable development. And therefore, Pope Francis makes a personal move. And the personal move he made was in a letter called Motu Proprio. This the nuncio can explain best to you. 
Motu proprio means personal initiative. When the Pope writes something and says motu proprio, it means that this is not something that required a synod, okay, for him to uh, decide. Motu proprio means personal initiative. So from this dream and wanting to promote integral devolve development, uh, he, on the 17th of August 2016, he decided to bring these officers of the Vatican together to pursue this integral human development project. Because, and this is what he said at the beginning. In all her being and actions, the church is called to promote integral human development. <coughs> this is the mission of the church. In all her being and action, the church is called to promote integral human development. And then he goes on to say, this development takes place by attending to the inestimable good of justice, peace, and the care of creation. And so, motu proprio is coming. The success of Peter, affirming these values, is continuously adapting the institutions which collaborate with him, like justice and peace like the Council of Culture, like all of these institutions collaborating with him, the successor of Peter, affirming his values, continuously adapts these institutions which collaborate with him to better meet the needs of men and women they serve. That is why the, for, uh, the offices were put together. It is the adapting, uh, adaptation of the structures which work with the Pope. Before this motu proprio, we had a council for justice and peace. We had a council for health care. We had a council for migrants and itinerant people. And we had core unum, okay, for charitable and uh, humanitarian assistance. So the successor of Peter, adapting the institutions, decided to put all of this together to enable them to pursue this project of integral human development. So that is the sense of the motu proprio. Peter's successor adapts things all the time, okay, to make this happen. So therefore, the merger of the four dicasteries, Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, Cor Unum, Council for Healthcare, and all of that, represents, okay, this type of uh, uh, initiative of the, the Pope. So this is what happened. Healthcare, Cor Unum, justice and peace, migrants and Nigerian people, these now are put together, now drawing attention to migration and creation. Now these are the two things that the Pope is talking about. And what is this merger trying to do? Development of each person, the whole person, and all people. This is what integral human development is all about. Development, not just each person, but each person and even everything about that individual person. So each person, not only technologically, materialistically, economically, but also culturally, socially, religiously, and all of that. So the whole person, everything about the person, and then all people put together. That is what integral human development is all about. So the vision is this. What we hold important is the human person, each man, each group of men, and we even include the whole of humanity, according to Paul VI. So the structure now goes on. We integrate in there for the common dignity, common good, and the common home of all of humanity. And that means that we're looking at the diverse people on Earth. Then we're looking at the economic, ecology, governance, and all of these other structures of society. We're bringing them all together. The culture, the family life, and the personal lifestyle of people are involved. Individuals and community dimensions of humanity are also involved. And all the dimensions of a person are involved. So integral human development involves us in all of this. So as you can tell now, we're entering the work of our office, OK? So if we were set up to pursue integral human development, how do we go about this? So this is what we think, and this is how we proceed. So trying to fashion for our own self clarity about our work. So diverse, everybody, different people on earth, 
their systems of economics, governance, ecology, and all of that we look at. We're looking at the culture, the lifestyle of people. We're looking at our people living in individual and community, indigenous populations, whatever populations, migrants, and all. All of these are now taken on board in our talk about integrated development. And at the end of that, what are we hoping to achieve? We want to promote the values and the goods of all so that everybody can see some justice, some peace and care of creation exercise and realize for all of them. These are the core values that we pursue in our office. So we synthesize that as a mission. So the mission of our office is to promote the scientific and the pastoral response of the Holy See to the questions related to human dignity, which justice and peace used to do, development, poverty, migration, and Pope Francis decided to exercise personal leadership of migration now. And there's one here in our midst who works in this department that the Pope Francis, they meet with the Pope once every month to plan the new things about migration, healthcare, charitable works, care of creation, and then Stella Maris. Stella Maris is sometimes also called the apostolate of the sea. This is a chaplaincy for seafarers. Okay, uh, very, very active, I suppose, here in Taiwan and a whole lot of uh, places. This is also part. So this, this is the form that our mission takes. And what are we supposed to do? What, are, what is our task? According to Pope Francis, our, our, the task of our office promoting integral human development, we need to promote the social teaching of the church in order to imbue social, economic, and political relations with the spirit of the gospel. Then we need to study and research in the areas of justice and peace, development of people, human dignity, human rights, migration, imprisonment, torture, capital punishment, peace, war, all of those things. Huh? And then we need to encourage and to coordinate initiatives of Episcopal conferences. So out there in the Vatican, we need to work with the local church. So we encourage Episcopal conferences, local churches, Catholic institutions to provide effective and appropriate assistance, both material and spiritual, if necessary, by means of suitable pastoral structures. So this is our task. And what kind of attitude do we go about doing this? The attitude with which we go about doing this is love and service, as Pope Francis shows us. This is Pope Francis in the prison, okay, in Italy. So our faith in Christ, who became poor and was always close to the poor and outcast, is the basis of our concern for integral human development. Okay, so our concern for the poor and the outcast. That's what Mother Teresa of Calcutta did. That's what the very many soup kitchens you showed in your first slide also are trying to do. This is what it is for integral human development. And so the basis of all is an attempt to enter into dialogue with humanity about all these different problems. Therefore, how do we proceed? Pope Francis says, therefore, dialogue. Talk with the different institutions in society. Talk with the different institutions, dialogue with the different institutions in society to promote this integral human development. And then work also transversely. If the four offices have been put together, then when justice and peace is thinking, justice and peace thinks of the poverty issues, healthcare issues uh, must come together. So we work transversely. If an office is beginning to organize an event about economics and finance, it recognizes the implication of this for poverty, for healthcare, and for different issues. So two things direct our operations, dialogue and transversality. Transversality means that how can anybody talk about ecology without talking about poverty and without talking about healthcare? 
You can't talk about ecology and say, I'm not talking about poverty, I'm not talking about health care. These issues are all involved. Transversely, the teams work that way. So that's how we try to pursue. And therefore, dialogue means talk with other partners. And the first partners for us are local churches. That's why I accepted to come here. Because we need to talk with local churches. We need to talk with local groups. Otherwise, if we stay to our office, our office is in the Vatican. It's not in touch with people. It is the local churches that are in touch with people. And whatever we do out there in the, in the, in the office, we need to bring it down. And that happens when we meet. My, uh, the secretary of our dicastery went to Addis Ababa last week because the bishops of East Africa, 200 bishops were meeting. And so he went over there to tell, present them the same business. And from here in August, we shall be in Medellin. Again, the bishops of Latin America are coming together, and we'll be talking to them about the same type of term. So the, our first partners are just that local churches and Episcopal conferences. So that's why I'm here. So my pilgrimage is also a pilgrimage that responds to this, OK? that local churches are our first partners that we need to talk to. From the local churches, we get the issues which we deal and research with, and to local churches, the results and the findings come. Then we also work with the Secretariat of State, the Office of the Holy See. So everything that we do, we work with them. Recently, you may have heard that with another dicastery, the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith, we published a small booklet about the ethics of finance. It has not come here yet. Go to the Vatican website. Okay? You go to the, you do, you do internet, you go to the website for several terms. Visit also the Vatican website and see the very many other terms which are being published. We publish a small booklet about how can we help finance with some ethical thinking and consideration. Okay, that's the last thing that we did with the doctrine, the Office for Doctrine and Faith. So then delegation of the Holy Sees, like, you know, His Excellency here, the Nuncios, because they are, because they are report to the Holy See, copies are sent to our office from formation end to enable us to work on things and then the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences, Caritas Internationalis, Caritas Singapore, that's why we're here. Catholic institutions, huh? like sometimes the institution Conrad now, Foundation and several other Catholic institutions, that's, that's why get us going. And not only church group, we also go with NGOs. At the United Nations in Geneva, we work with a lot of NGOs too, think about different positions that are being formulated. Have you heard of the Global Compact on Migration before? This has been discussed now at the United Nations in New York. Global Compact on Migration and Refugees. Okay, the input from the Office of Migration in the Vatican is already gone there to help to promote this type of thinking. So we dialogue with civil governments and all of that. So also here the local church must also enter into dialogue with government. State and church, we work together. Because the subject of the, faith of the church, human beings. The subject of governance, human beings. Therefore, we cannot split human beings into here I'm political and here I'm. The, the dialogue needs to happen, OK, between us to make our visions come together. And so this is how we work. And we publish a lot of material about anniversary messages and different type of things. And this is the structure. The Holy Father, us, and then the office. But I'm rushing to get to, this is the structure that we work with now in the Vatican. OK, we have three bits. General administration, research, research and the development of social thought, and then the thing about healthcare, charity, and all of that. And then this section in, in pink, that is the group of migration and refugees that Pope Francis works with directly. Okay, and now, 
This is about you. This is where I want to conclude. Having talked about all what I've said, this is an event of characters. And if it's an event of characters, then we must be able to situate characters in all of this. So Pope Francis, Pope Benedict told us that charity is the soul of integral human development. And that's what we observe over here. So all the energy that the church has in doing this derives from charity. So charity is the heart of the church's social doctrine. Every responsibility and every commitment spelled out by the doctrine is derived from charity, from characters, from the very many other things that you do. Therefore, we can talk about principles. And the principle of charity in action is the more we strive to secure a common good corresponding to the real needs of our neighbor, the more effectively we love them. So we do what we do because we love. We are inspired by love. That's why we reach out to do whatever we do. All the different forms of ministry and activities of characters is because that's the way of showing concern and love. And then, second one is, when animated by charity, commitments to the common good has a greater weight and value. So charity drives it all. And therefore, what do we do? Each one of us, each one of us is invited to exercise and to live this charity according to its place in society business people, politicians, whatever. Each one of us, to the extent that we're Christians and whatever, each of us is invited to live charity in his own way. So Benedict wrote this. Every Christian is called to practice, to practice this charity in a manner corresponding to his vocation, according to a degree of influence in the society. If you're a politician, your charity becomes your political part. If you're a businessman, if you're an ordinary, whatever, whatever, everybody can live this charity, and that's what it invites us to do. And when each one responds to the call of charity, then we all contribute to the realization of integral human development. So by way of concluding, Caritas Christi Urget Nos, the charity of Christ drives us all, and that is the thing that we work with and this is the soul of integral human development, and I thank you for your kind attention. The rest would have been to pray. Thank you, Cardinal Vincent.